Joining us tonight is WWE Hall of Famer, WWE legend, the man who needs no introduction, the million dollar man, Ted DiBiase. Ted, thanks for joining us. It's great to be with you, Stephen, guys. Thanks. Now, uh, Ted, you, you came from a wrestling family with both your mother and father wrestling. When did you start to decide that wrestling was the right fit for you? Well, I loved the business my entire life, you know, for that for that very reason. You know, it's like there's a lot of people who say, well, my, there's a lot of second-generation wrestlers, but not. I can't think of anybody else that had both of their parents, you know, uh, wrestling. And so the, uh, you know, uh, the thought was always there. I mean, I grew up loving it. Uh, you know, it's like I idolized my dad. Of course, you know, once my mom and dad married, you know, um, my mother didn't wrestle anymore. So, I mean, it's like, I can only remember maybe one time when I was uh, young that I ever actually saw her wrestle. Um, but, uh, anyway, yeah, it's kind of like, I was like a little kid that grew up saying I wanted to be just like my dad. Mm -hmm. And so I've loved the business ever since I was very young. I used to, you know, I'd watch my dad and I'd wrestle on the floor with my little brother after the matches, you know, like a lot of kids do. And I'd, I'd get a I'd get a hairbrush and stand in front of the mirror and cut interviews, <laughs> um, all that stuff. But then you know, reality is that my you know my dad didn't want me to be in the wrestling business uh, for the same reason. Once I got in the wrestling business, I didn't really want my boys to do it. It's not the wrestling at all. It's it's the lifestyle. It's the it's how hard the the life is and, and what it can do to you. And uh, as a parent. Those are the things that you know. I, you know, I, I, I came to realize you know, why when I was when I was older. But anyway, um, I wanted to be like my dad, so I wanted to wrestle. Uh, but my my first love for the longest time became football, because you know, in the back of my mind, even though I loved wrestling, I didn't know if I would ever really do it. You know, because uh, I guess I, I would venture to say that if my dad had lived, you know, out of respect for him, I probably wouldn't have done it. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, I did. <laughs> no, you received a, a scholarship to West Texas University for football, like you were saying. So um, you weren't the only professional wrestler who were you attended there. Barry Windham, Tito Santana, Dusty Rhodes, and the Funks, uh, among others, went to West, uh, West Texas State. So what do you think brought so many of you legends and Hall of Famers down to West Texas State University? Well, West Texas State, the influence there was the Funk family. Um Dory Funk Sr. was the promoter of what was dead in the Amarillo Territory. And, uh, you know, both of his sons, Dory Jr. and Terry, attended West Texas State. And I think it was just a, that influence going forward, uh, different guys that, that came along, um, you know, that, that came to the school to play football but ended up becoming wrestlers. Bruiser Brody, Stan Hansen, uh, you know, um, Oh my gosh, uh, Dusty Rose. Actually, Dusty what didn't play football. Dusty was a baseball player, you know. But again, it was the influence of the of the Fung family. And uh, it, you know, when I was there, you know, there was three guys that became stars uh, on one team: Tully Blanchard, myself, and Tito Santana. were all on the same team. Wow! And wow. After us was uh, 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 Kelly Kaniski, who didn't stay in the business, and then Barry Windham and Manny Fernandez. So it's just. It's kind of a joke, you know, like that West Texas State graduated more pro wrestlers than pro football players. Hmm. <laughs> now, uh, you, you mentioned uh, the Funks. Uh, you were trained by Terry and Dory Funk Jr., uh, two of the greats. Uh, uh, do you feel that you learned everything you needed to know about pro wrestling from the Funks? I don't think I learned everything from them, but, I mean, that was the beginning for me. The beginning of my, under, you know, my 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 beginning to learn the understanding of the psychology of wrestling started with the funks and uh you know in retrospect if you if you examine the territories back in the days of the territories 
and you look at the guys that went through and came out of Amarillo, and then you look at the guys that went through and came out of uh, Mid South. You're going to see, you know, just you know the A list of guys. Well, just look at all the guys that came out of West Texas State. That I mean, that didn't just become wrestlers; that all became stars. Yeah. It's incredible. Um, but uh, and again, the 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 Funks and. Again, Dory Funk Sr. was very good friends, uh, very, very good friends with a guy named Eddie Graham. And Eddie Graham's regretted by just about everybody. He's probably the greatest in terms of ring psychology. Bill Watts is another guy who studied under Eddie Graham. Uh, Dusty Rhodes is another guy <laughs> as, as a booker that studied under Eddie Graham, and they were all great. So, um, But I think that was the influence there. All right, and now, were the Funks as wild as everyone says, or could you remember anything from training from them that was a, maybe a funny story about that? Oh, my gosh, you know. <laughs> um, uh, um, uh, I, you know, I can't, you know, Dory Jr., uh, I would say, was a little more reserved than Terry. <laughs> <laughs> Terry was a wild guy. <laughs> you know, Terry was a guy, in, and just, uh, you know, the thing that's great about Terry Funk is that he could give you everything. You know, I don't think that I've ever seen Junior, Dory Junior, in a, you know, I've never seen him, you know, he had one style and that, and, his, and it was great. I mean, you know, he was a consummate pro. You know, he was a guy that definitely deserved to be a world champion because he, he could go in the ring and he could wrestle. You know, he could show you and, 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 and that he could wrestle. Uh, and that's why some of the classic world championship matches that I've ever seen were between him and Jack Briscoe. But his brother, Terry, Terry could do the same thing, but then Terry could flip it. Terry could be just as wild and as crazy, I mean, uh, as the next guy. And, you know, and he was, you know. Yep. Um, so, and, uh, but of the two brothers, I would probably say that Terry had more influence. I think just because I was closer to him in in, uh, in age, I mean, Junior's a little older than, than his brother, um, and it was just... Uh, Terry's the guy that just kind of became like a brother to me. So, uh, as a matter of fact, when my opportunity came to go to the WWF, as it was then, I, uh, you know, I, anytime I made a major decision in my career, I always ran it by Terry. You know, and so, uh, and of course, when I told, told him what Vince had in mind, he said, you know what, pack your bag, don't look back. You know, if, you know, if he's got something, you know, which which the idea was, the whole Million Dollar Man concept was Vince McMahon original. And uh, he said if, if he's got that and he thinks you're the guy for it, he says you'd be an idiot not to go. <laughs> <laughs> so I went, and the rest is history. Right. Now, before you went to WWE, you spent a lot of time in Mid-South Wrestling. Um, you also spent some time traveling around the different territories. But your first match was against Danny Hodge, who has quite a reputation. Um, can you kind of walk us through that that match? Well, I couldn't walk you through the match. It was so long ago, I, could, I couldn't remember the entire <laughs> match. Uh, and, of course, we're talking about a, a TV match, you know, in a, in a studio that, mm-hmm. you know, in a one-hour show. So that match probably didn't last five minutes. And the reality is I was so nervous that... You know, um, you know, I, I couldn't. You know, I couldn't tell you the first thing. All I could tell you was this: was that um, from the very beginning, my greatest concern was to. I was always extremely conscious of not wanting fans to be able to see through my work. In mm-hmm. other words. Every time I got in the ring, the attitude was, if I don't accomplish anything else, I'm going to make sure these people uh, believe what they see. And so uh, until I could throw a good punch, I didn't throw a punch. And, of course, back then, when you're a young guy breaking into business and you're in an opening match, you know, you don't throw punches. You know, you, it's like, you know, you wrestle. It's, again, psychology. You know, there was a time when guys in the first or second match would throw a punch. You know, it's like it was, as the night went on, the it got more and more. It was like if you start throwing punches and and, and hit people and have chairs in the first match, and by the time you get to the main event, who cares? Mm. And that was my yeah. whole problem with ECW. You know, like from from bell to bell, it was just uh, you know, 
And of course, they had a call following, no doubt about that. But just, just you know, it's like how many times can you, you know, by the end of the night, you're like, you know, if somebody, you know, splits his head wide open with a with a chair, they they've already seen it four or five times. So why is it special? And uh, you know, I don't know, I don't know if that answers your question, but um, the um, you know. The match with Danny Hodge, of course, because of the reputation, and you know what? He was just as he was just as um, gentle as he could be. I mean, uh, you know, he wasn't somebody that was going to go out there and you know and you know twist me into a knot and and uh, make me scream or anything like that. But uh, you know, I mean, I paid him all due respect, and uh, and I kind of I kind of proud of the fact that. If, my first television match was was going to be with somebody, you know. That was a, that was a great guy to start with. Yeah. Now, uh, yeah. Now, Ted, uh, a- after spending nearly four years in Mid South, you went on to WWF, becoming its first North American champion. Uh, did you feel that winning that championship was your big break? Well, you know, I I I, w- I came into the WWF as I was introduced as the the as the, as the North American champion. Mm-hmm. That's what Vince McMahon said. When we bring you in here, we're going to introduce you. So nobody at that time, you know, the, the WWF had, didn't at that time. They had their tag, te- they had their world tag team champion, their world champion, and their world's lady champion, and there were no other titles. And so he introduced me as the North American champion. So it was a pretty unique thing. And then uh, along the way, you know, I happened to mention, that, you know, I didn't tell him right away, but you know, I, I met, mentioned to him at some point. I said, you know, Bill Watts' champion down in Mid South is called the North American champion that she wasn't aware of. And so that's how that happened. You know, I dropped the belt to uh, Pat Patterson. But Pat Patterson then, I mean, he didn't actually, you know, they just made up a story. But Pat went off to some tournament in Rio de Janeiro, Rio de Janeiro, and uh, they, uh, uh, you know, everybody put up their titles, and then whoever won the tournament would come out the intercontinental champion, and he won it. Ah. And uh, so... It's kind of funny, you know, Pat's always been given credit as being the first Intercontinental Champion, and I guess he was, but in reality, it was me. Ah, well, there you go, you Jonathan. Know. Learn something new every day. I mean, it wasn't really, I mean, you know, I, mean I, wasn't ever, I was never called the Intercontinental, Intercontinental Champion, but I was the first person brought into the WWF with a title that had, you know, that previously, again, for their... For their history, they, they had a world champion, world tag team champions, and a world ladies champion. So, um, hmm. there's a little backstory to that. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, now, we kind of talked not a lot, but uh, about the territory system. Do you feel that professional wrestling suffered once most of its territories started to get bought up or they just kind of got disbanded? Do you think that that was needed to, to grow as a professional wrestler, the territory system? Well, you know, here's the thing. It's almost like uh, a catch twenty two situation. You know, you're you're screwed if you do, and you're screwed if you don't. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, I was like, when when I first started started watching and seeing what Vince was doing, and what Vince did was really a stroke of genius. I mean, you know, looking back, I mean, uh, he took wrestling, which was, you know, I mean, wrestling was pretty much a blue collar crowd form of entertainment. It wasn't really mainstream. It wasn't your, you know, it wasn't, I don't think it was ever considered family entertainment. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's what he made it, by dressing up the characters and making them very animated over the top. You know, you, you always knew who the good guys were, the bad guys were, and ultimately the good guy would win. And, and then, you know, so you got the superheroes, which, you know, like Hulk Hogan and the whole I mean, I was like, a you know, million dollar man, I was like wrestling's answer to Snidely, Snidely Whiplash, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, with the boisterous laugh and the whole deal. But um, when Vince started this, he had the entire country and all those territories to get his talent from. Now, you know, the story goes is that he he went to all those promoters and, and invited them. He says, here's what I'm about to do. Hey, everybody, I mean, he gave everybody full warning. Here's what I'm about to do. I'd love for you to join me, yeah, but if you don't join, join me, just know that I'm coming. And so, of course, the only ones that I think really went with him was where the Briscoes down in Florida. 
mm-hmm. at the time. Um, the flip side of that is, you know, where are all where's all the new talent going to come from? That's the problem. Is that in wrestling today? You know, uh, they've got a tra- tremendous training facility down in Orlando. I've been there. I spent a week there as a special guest trainer, um, and it's a great thing they're doing. But the bottom line is, you can't learn this business working in a gym, working out in a gym. You have got to get in front of a live crowd, and it's kind of like uh, it's an it's an apprenticeship. It's you know. We would work every single night, and we would work in front of a different crowd every night in a different town every night. It was a circuit, you know. I would say, you know, you know, each night of the week, you know, you came back to the same towns on a weekly basis, and doing that, you had to, you know, you had to have, you learn how to really work because now you, you know, you can't go back there and have the same match all the time. So you got to think, you know, it forced you to think, forced you to grow. Uh, and when you first start, you know, uh, a rookie like me, uh, you know, I might be on the first match in some podunk town, but the guy across the ring from me has probably been working, you know, five, six, seven years and has the ability to lead me. And so you watch other talent and you glean from them. You see something you like and you, you take it and you, uh, and you make it part of your repertoire. And over a period of time, you develop your own character. And, and, uh, that's just not, it's, you know, it's just a cookie cutter thing now. It seems, you know, like in the reason there's so much more drama in the shows as you don't have guys today that know how to do that. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I, I never had a scripted match in my life. I mean, and I'll be honest with you, the reason I didn't do well there when I went back as a producer was that reason. You know, I told Arn Anderson, you know, you know, Arn, I said, you know what? I said, I can't do this. I said, because I never did it. I said, the only thing I knew when I walked in the ring, and you know that, you know, he knew it. I knew the finish. I knew exactly how it was going to end and maybe how it was going to start. And that, you know, and, and how it started might was probably based on what I had done with the guy that, the, the last time I wrestled with him. In other words, if you've got a story or, a, or an angle going already, you go, okay, here's what we, here's how, here's the last thing that people saw us do. Here's what their attitude should be tonight. So maybe according to that, we should do this, but everything in the middle was ad lib. Yeah. And, and that's the gift. That's the real art mm-hmm. of wrestling. And it's a dying art. Yeah. Uh, and it's not the talent's fault. It's not the talent's fault because they very, it's, it's simply the, the process by which that the you learn how to work in this business does not exist anymore. Uh, it just, it doesn't. I mean, uh, the, that the territories made it that way. That, that was like, it was almost like, you know, uh, now I guess, you know, if you could have a farm system like uh, baseball, you know, and if yeah. you could have territories where, you know, or at least a couple where the guys could go and and wrestle on regional television, and uh, and and learn the trade that way and move up. And they try to do that as best they can down in Florida, but I mean, it's just not the same. And people, you know, it's it's just you know they're they're not gonna you know it's just you know uh, they're not gonna they're not gonna pay the, they're not gonna pay the dollar to do it. It's just not gonna it's not the same. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I don't know. I don't know that it's, that it's fixable. I mean, uh, as much as I love the, the the business and I support the WWE, and there's a lot of great talent, and there's a, I mean, there's a lot of guys with great talent and a lot of charisma, and you got to have that, you know. But it's, um, and I will say this now: there are some guys that that I have seen come on, and you know, like you take John Cena back when they first started pushing John Cena. You know, uh, uh, he had some charisma, you know, but, you know, I, I wasn't crazy about his work. Well, he, his work, you know, he's always, he's got kind of an awkward style, but his work is much better now than it was when they, when he became the champion, you know, I mean, yeah. how many years ago? Yeah. And, and why? Because he's had that much time to, you know, by the time I went to the WWF and became the million dollar man, I'd, I'd been wrestling 12 years. I, yeah, that makes a difference. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. So I mean, uh, 
and you know it's kind of like so they're doing the best they can because people ask me that question all the time why why is there so much it's it's so much drama and not enough action and i go that's the reason you know um and it's hard to explain if you don't understand the business sure uh, but anyway yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's the one i i can give you <laughs> all right <laughs> now now ted uh, your list of feuds read as a who's who in professional wrestling uh who do you think your greatest feud was with and uh, who did you enjoy working with the most? Uh, gosh, well, you know, prior to the WWE, I would say that uh, the the biggest um, angle that I ever had, and the, and the biggest feud that I ever had, was when I turned heel and uh, had the and then I shot the angle of Junker Dog down here in Mid South, uh, and of course, you know, then I went to Atlanta. You know, and I, you know, in Atlanta, I, I did something similar there and had a run with Tommy Rich, and, uh, but, but I would say the, the, the feud with JYD, and then in the WWF, um, you know, it's hard to say. I mean, uh, uh, I had a great run with Macho Man. I mean, that was, you know, the whole thing when they, the whole first year of my, you know, when I came in, I came on the scene in the summer of, uh, uh what was that, 80? 87, and then by WrestleMania in March of 88, you know, that the culmination was that tournament, you know, the thing with me uh, saying I was going to buy the belt and the whole deal, but, you know, even though I lost to that match with Savage, then for the next almost year, it was either me and Savage in single matches, some, or me and, and whoever, Andre oftentimes against him and Hulk or him and or, you know, Hulk and somebody. So I had a pretty good run with uh, with Macho Man and loved working with him. Absolutely loved it. And then, then the next uh, the next one that I think that I enjoyed the most and uh, probably was the most significant would be with Jake. Mm, yes. You know, I had a good run with Jake the Snake and loved working with him too. Actually, my favorite... WrestleMania match was with Jake at uh, WrestleMania six. Now you've had some pretty amazing firsts. You've introduced a lot of people into the the WWE. Um, but something that people may not know is that you actually wrestled Hulk Hogan in his first Madison Square Garden match. Uh, when you when you had that match with him, did you think he was going to become the star that he did when you wrestled him that night? Uh, no, I mean, I, I had no idea. I knew that, uh, I knew that, that they just, uh, you know, with his size and his appearance and everything, you know, I, I, mean, I could just see the dollar signs in Vince Sr.'s eyes. <laughs> uh, but, you know, when I wrestled Hulk that, at that time, he was still pretty green. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I'd been in the business, like, I think by that time, that was, um, what year was that? That was 80, uh, or 79, right? So I've been working, uh, you know, for for four four and a half years, and you know I, I don't know that he had had much experience prior to that, and I I was a baby face and he was the heel, <laughs> and and, you know, and I of course I called the match and and uh, you know Vince Senior really paid me a compliment because I, I went to Vince because I knew I said yeah, I know you really want to get this guy over strong, and 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 that match with Hulk. His first match in the Garden was my last appearance in the WWF. That's mm-hmm. the first run I made because when I, when, I, when that match was up the next day, I got on a plane and I flew to uh, I flew back and, and started in Mid South and I was back in the Mid South again. All right. So, um, but no, I had no idea. I don't think anybody did. Now, uh, Ted, uh, you you technically held the WWF championship, even though you purchased it. Uh, do you think at that point in your career, though, you deserve to actually win the title? Well, you know, people always ask me this. You're the one guy that so many people say should have, uh, you know, been the champion, and you never really were officially a champion. You know, you know, the NWA, the same thing. Um, you know, I was one of the uh, two or three guys at one time. You know, being covered as an NWA world champion, it never happened. Um, of course, there's politics in a lot of that, too. But as far as the WWF title, um, you know, in reality, when we went to WrestleMania 4, the first thought was that I would win 
that tournament. And of course, if I might have won that tournament, I would have had a run with Hogan the, and the belt. And it, you know, it's the thing you keep feeding the you keep feeding the the, the main guy heels. So I'd had my run, and then I'd have dropped the belt back to Hogan, and you know, I'd have got back in line. Um, the whole idea about me creating my own belt put a lot more heat on me. Mm-hmm. And that's what this business is. It's about making money. And so, you know, uh, would, have I, would I have liked to have been world champion at some point? Yeah, that'd be nice to say that you're a world champion. But in reality, you know, championship belts are props in this business. And it is a business. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's like, you know, it's like somebody saying, well, I was, eight, you know, eight-time or nine-time or 15-time <laughs> world champion. I said, yeah, because somebody <laughs> wrote that into the script, pal. <laughs> you know, quit believing your own, you know, you know. Yep, yep. It's a business. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, is, 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 am I hurt or am I dismayed because of that? No, not all right. at all. Okay, so you were also a part of a very successful tag team, uh, Money Incorporated, with Erwin R. Scheister. Um, now, I have my own uh, – thought about this but i would ask you what do you think your most memorable match uh as a a part of uh money inc was (laughs) well um you know i'm not sure if it was the greatest match but the most memorable match that we had i can guarantee you was wrestling the road warriors in front of eighty thousand people at wembley stadium that's the one was just about out of his mind on uh, painkillers. Oh. Oh. As a matter of fact, the reason that we went on first, I mean, here we are, the World Tag Team Champions, we're the first match. Well, the reason we were the first match is we told Vince, they said, we said, Vince, if you don't put us out there now, if we wait an hour and a half or whatever, he said, he might not, he, he might, he might not be able to go to the ring. Wow. Yeah. And, and that's why we went out first. So yeah, that was the most memorable match. <laughs> oh boy! Hey, but you know what? I love those guys. I mean, you know, Hawk was a great guy. I mean, you know, and eventually he got that under control in his life. And uh, uh, you know, irregardless, of, you know, we all have our issues. Absolutely, every one of us have our our, 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 our demons. And uh, but uh, there's a guy who would give you literally the shirt off his back. And he's one of those guys. If you were gonna have, if you had the choice to have one friend go walk down a dark alley with you, and you knew you were gonna have to face fifteen guys, who would that one one guy be? It would be Mike Extra, because he was legitimately as tough as they come. Mm-hmm. The only one back, the only other guy, you know, beyond that guy, people ask me, and I would probably say that would Haku. You know, Haku yeah. was one of those guys too. Some. Kind of like, where does a 300-pound gorilla sleep? Anywhere he wants to. Yeah, that was definitely the, the match I was thinking about. I remember you guys, uh, they came out on the, the motorcycles, and you had a, a brand-new suit on, and uh, I remember watching that, and it was definitely my 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 favorite Money, Inc. match, for sure. <laughs> now, uh, Ted, uh, as uh, your tag team career started to wind down, after winning an impressive three tag team championships, you began your career as a manager. You know, at that point in your career, were you happy to not be wrestling anymore and just, you know, still be a part of the business and uh, managing? Well, you know, the reason that I, I went from wrestling to managing, I, I would continue to wrestle longer had it not been for a neck injury. And in reality, the neck injury was not actually an injury. It wasn't like I had a match and, oh, my gosh, I hurt my neck. Hmm. It was something that manifested itself after. Like, I, I had, when I had left the WWF at the end of 93, in the SummerSlam 93, I wrestled Razor Ramon. That was the last match I actually ever had in the United States. And um, and I went to Japan for a while. And the reason I, the only reason I left at that time, is you know you know I mean if you've read my story you know in, in March of '92, uh, just a little bit earlier, I is when this life change happened to me when I had to, when I could, was confronted by my wife with you know adultery and and, and, and crazy living and lifestyle and realized I was, I was putting at risk the most valuable things in my life, you know, uh, the, the stroke and ego trip, and my life turned around. And by the summer of 93, I realized if I don't, if I don't get out of here for a while, 
I'm going to let this is going to suck me back in. In other words, you know, if you're going to quit drinking, then you, you, know, you can't hang out in the bar. And back then, you know, life on the road for us was like rock stars. It was the next town, the next show, the next party, the next girl, down the road you go. And, um, and so that's really why I left in 93. Now, when I left, I went back to work in Japan for about two, two I did two tours. And, I, and literally, I went back over to Japan. The first night I was in Japan, uh, all Japan for wrestling giant, Baba put the World Tag Team Championship belts on me in San Hansen again. My first night. You know, and then I thought, man, I'm off and running again. Well, that's when this neck neck thing manifested itself. And so, by the end of '93, I had I had left wrestling physically, and uh, I got a call from Vince to come and do commentary with him for, I believe it was the uh, the Royal Rumble in mm-hmm. February of '94, uh, and uh, it was prior to you know WrestleMania 10. And uh, and he liked it, and I enjoyed it. And uh, I said, I told him, I said, hey, if you're interested, I'd like to give this a go. And you know, I said, I have nothing against coming back, and you know, you know, in a managing role. And he said, we'll come to WrestleMania 10, and and, and we'll see. Huh. And all well, the rest is history, you know. So I became a, a, a commentator and a manager. Right. Uh, yeah, and uh, had a pretty good run. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, you left the W, the then WWF for WCW shortly after you started the Million Dollar Corporation. Um, as soon as you got to WCW, you immediately became part of the NWO. Even though you were part of something as big as the NWO, uh, what were your initial thoughts going into WCW after just being in the WWF? Well, I mean, I went to WCW. Really, I wasn't. I wasn't disappointed. Uh, WWF. Uh, I just Vince moved me. Vince put me back on the road, and that's a business decision. And in reality, mm-hmm. in hindsight, I should have sat down and talked to Vince. You know, but at my time, I just said, "Look, Vince is a businessman. He's not interested in my personal problems, and he's you know got to do what he's got to do. So I got to do what I got to do. And if, if if my working for him means me being on the road, then I can't do it because being on the road was that danger zone for me. And so I went to WCW. In the same, you know, as a manager commentator, and um, um, I'll be honest with you, uh, I was shocked. The most ill-run organization I ever worked for was WCW, and uh, it was like the fact that. And I'm going to tell you something. The only reason that they competed for, with Vince and the wrestling wars went on uh, for as long as they did is because. You had you had stars created by Vince McMahon that were now going to end up against new stars created by Vince McMahon because Eric Bischoff mm-hmm. couldn't create a star if it hit him in the, in the head. <laughs> you, know, he, you, know, you know, I'm sorry, he just doesn't have the ability. He doesn't know how to make a star. Yeah, Vince McMahon knows how to create stars. And so, um, it was just a very poor run organization and, I, and when that my three year contract was up to them, I was ready to go. Uh, well, Ted, now, after WCW folded, uh, you started making appearances for several promotions uh, before starting your ministry called Heart of David. Uh, why did you start uh, the ministry, and anything you could tell us a little bit more about that? Well, in reality, I didn't, you know, I didn't really hop around to any other promotions. There was a, there was a one thing, one day somebody asked me to come do this one deal. Uh, I can't remember what they even called it now, but it, you know, it was a one-time thing, and it flopped. And you know, it was just the, the the money was right. But the main the main thing I did was, you know, in the in like uh, summer of uh, ninety nine is when I when I stopped wrestling, and I, I mean that's when the wrestling as as a vocation in life ended. And I now went to work, working towards going out and doing ministry. Uh, it was something I felt led to over a period of time. I mean, this started back in '94. You know, even when I was wrestling and I was I was managing and commentating, what have you, in the WWE and then both WCW. Uh, there were a lot of times. There, there were a lot of opportunities. You know, along the way where I was going and starting starting to speak in churches, and so that that was my decision. You know, as I, you know, I decided that when my contract with WCW ran out, I was done. And so in uh, February of 2000, 
Um, I was ordained through my local church, in, in, um, uh, except for about a year and a half stint with the WWE as a part of their creative team and slash producer. Uh, um, I've been a full-time ministry ever since. And, you know, it's, uh, again, it's ministry is a calling on your life. Ministry is something you don't wake up one day. It's like, like I'll do God a favor. Uh, it's something that I, that grew within me for a long time. Okay. And, uh, you know, uh, to whom much is given, much is required. I believe that. And, uh, and so, you know, I, I feel like uh, I've been given a lot, uh, you know, by God's grace, you know, I, I've been able to enjoy you know, in spite of some of the stupid things that I've been able to enjoy, a wonderful career. Uh, you know, about this guy that was that, that was loving and kind enough to uh, stick with me through hard times and forgive me and restore my marriage. And uh, so, you know, um, you know, if I'd have stayed a little bit longer in the ring, you know, I might have been one of those guys with a million dollar contract, uh, and I could have, mm -hmm. but I chose not to. I mean, literally, when this thing with my neck happened, I could have gone. I could have had a, uh, I could have had surgery, and I could have continued to wrestle. But I knew that if, you know, I was just, I was at, a, I was about to turn forty. My dad had, had had a heart attack and died in the ring when he was forty-five years old. And I told myself right then, I said, "That's not going to be me." I made myself mm -hmm. a promise that I would not stay too long. I wasn't going to end up being one of those old guys that keeps trying to go out in the ring and prove himself. And still wrestle when he's, you know, you know. I mean, you know, I love Rick Flair to death, but you know, Rick, get over it. Yeah, <laughs> it's over. It's over. You yep. know what? I mean, I'm 61 in January, and that makes Rick 66. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And if they let him, he'd climb in the ring and wrestle tomorrow. <laughs> And, you know, and if he did, I'd say, Rick, okay, if you're going to do it, put a body shoe on, please. <laughs> you know? <laughs> now, you, you were inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame as the headliner, no doubt. Um, what was the, it, was that the best moment of your wrestling career? Uh, I, you know, it, it was definitely a highlight, absolutely. I mean, to be inducted into the Hall of Fame, you know, you're being recognized by your peers, you know, by your, by your you know, you know, and, and included in, in a group that, you know, a lot of the guys included in that group were guys that I looked up to and admired. So, yeah, it's, it's a very special moment. Uh, I mean, you know, I, you know, was it the moment? I don't know if it was the moment of my life, but uh, <laughs> in terms of, you know, um, I don't think I could pick one. There were several huge moments in my wrestling career, but um, that would actually, you know, absolutely bad. That's the cherry on the top, though, for sure. Round. As the million dollar man, what was the most expensive thing you ever bought? A million dollar belt. All right. Uh, Virgil. Not very bright. <laughs> <laughs> um, who came up with the idea for the million dollar championship? Vince McMahon. Uh, Hulk Hogan. Consummate pro. Made a lot of money with What is the question you get asked the most about the Million Dollar Man? Did I really jilt that little boy out of the money when I kicked the basketball? <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is no. It was all staged. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, who is your favorite wrestler of all time? My dad. Right. Vince McMahon. You know what? A guy that I will be forever grateful for because I wouldn't be doing this interview if it weren't for him. And uh, you talk about a guy, I mean, love him and hate him. You know, I mean, it's kind of like a love-hate relationship, but I think anybody that's ever had a boss has had that. But uh, the guy has an unbelievable work ethic. You know, there's no way I can, in, in a few words, describe Vince McMahon. But uh, he's, he's a working machine, and he's as disciplined as they come. And uh, it's kind of like uh, there, there. You know, there are times when I have sat in awe of that work ethic. It's like, and you know, and, and look what it's done. You know, uh, and they also say there's a fine line between genius and insane. And I believe <laughs> this walks that line. 
<laughs> now, uh, how did you come up with your signature laugh? Again, uh, I did an interview at one of the TV tapings. Vince happened to be walking by, and he heard it. He stuck his head in the door, and he said, That is the Million Dollar Man. I want to hear that laugh every time you do an interview. And so, <laughs> once again, it was Vince who trademarked my laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, now this is our Thanksgiving show that we're doing. So, could you just give us like a couple things you're thankful for? Uh, gosh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm thankful that uh, I'm still married to a wonderful woman. I'm thankful that I'll be able to celebrate Thanksgiving uh, at home with my family, and uh, I'm thankful that I'm able to watch my grandchildren grow up. Uh, you know, and I'm thankful for an unbelievable career, and I'm thankful for wrestling fans. Because wrestling fans, in my opinion, are some of the loyalist fans in, 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 in the industry. Once they're there, they just stick with you. And if it weren't for the fans, again, you and I wouldn't be having this conversation. And I wouldn't have much to talk about. So I, I would say thank you for all the fans. Now, uh, Ted, we we here at another wrestling podcast really uh, appreciate your time with us tonight. We, it's an honor to have you on, and we are humbled that you uh, allowed us to the time that you did tonight. Thank you very much. Well, I appreciate it, guys. Uh, you know, and uh, uh, you know, I, I, you know again, uh, it's because of guys like you and other interviews like this that you know it it, it keeps me going and it keeps my name out there and. and uh, uh, you know, in reality, is I, I couldn't give three nickels about being famous anymore. But it's what it helps me do is it helps open doors uh, to pursue the passion of my life now, and that is to present people with change in my life because of Jesus Christ. And um, uh, again, I tell guys all the time, people all the time, I said I'm not a wrestler in the physical sense of the word. You know, I haven't climbed the ring, put the back in a long time, but I, I, I wrestle now for the souls of men. And I can tell you countless stories about lives that have been changed, including mine. Um, you know, not by my power, but by the power of, 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 a, of a Savior who died on a cross and rose from the dead and will come again. Uh, I firmly believe that with all my heart. Um, and that's, that's why I keep doing what I'm doing. And, and that's why I thank you guys for uh, allowing me this opportunity to uh, to share a little bit of that with you. Yep, thank you. And that, well, yeah, we definitely appreciate it. Now, is there anything uh, – we do live in a world with all the social media and websites and all that stuff. Is there anything that you would like to uh, use to direct people, whether it's Twitter or a website or anything like that? Yeah, on Twitter, uh, my Twitter handle is MDM, Ted DiBiase. And, uh, you know, Facebook, uh, again, I mean, there's, I have a, um, I have a, um, you know, like a personal Facebook page, but then I also have a, uh, um, you know, like a business page. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I don't think it'd be hard to find. Ted, thank you so much for your time once again. I really appreciate it. All right, man. Thank you. Um.